Um, have you got um, this collection of ancient documents that we know as the Bible these days? How many of you know? It's not one book. It was never written as one book. Who knows that? Yep, 66 different books written over 1,500 years. Think about that. What book do you know? What collection of documents do you know that could be written by, by I think it's 30-something individuals over, uh, uh, over 1,500 years, three separate continents of planet Earth written from palaces, from caves, from the wilderness, written by people chained up uh, in dungeons, and yet that one story, 1,500 years of story is consistent from start to finish. It all, everything in the Old Testament points forward to a moment in human history, which was the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Everything after that in the New Testament, it all points back to that same moment in human history, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. And we have probably five or six or seven copies of this thing in our houses and collecting dust. And I wonder how often we pick them up, how often we read them, how often we look at them. Uh, it's the biggest selling book in human history. Did you know that? If you Google what's the biggest selling book of all time, the Bible comes up. And uh, it's amazing. It's great that we can go, hey, we read from the greatest selling book in human history. But the truth is it's way more than just a book, isn't it? Uh, for you to, to, to read that as it is, as a collection of ancient historical documents, all being compiled together in one volume we call the Bible. Uh, but when you read it that way and you understand, it's not just a book. Not just a book. This is the history of the world according to God. And the way that God wanted it to be remembered and the way that God wanted to communicate it to us. I don't know. I, I find that uh, exciting. I, I quite enjoy uh, the fact that when I'm picking this thing up and I'm reading it, it's not like reading Woman's Day or, or you know... Cosmo or whatever it is. That, not that I read Woman's Day. I can see where you're going with this. I don't read Woman's Day. I don't read Cosmo. They're just the first things that pop into my mind, probably because back when I was a kid, they were, they were, were bigger. But um, anyway, it's not like picking up Rugby League Week or Engineering Monthly or something like that. Mechanics Weekly, anything like that. That's the point I'm making, Pete. Thank you. If you do have one, though, can you open to Matthew chapter 6? We've been talking uh, the last few weeks about the issue of anxiety and worry and uh, we've kind of been trekking along and I told you I want to get to Matthew 6 because when we think of don't worry, uh, Matthew 6 is usually the biggie that we think of when Jesus taught uh, the Sermon on the Mount and in Matthew 6 Jesus begins to go into this uh, a few verses where he hones in on this issue of worry and he, he, he tells us basically he says don't worry about your life. Um, Now, we could stand up here and just say, don't worry about your life, but I think we need to look at the broader context of what he's looking at and talking about. And so we've been doing that for a few weeks. And what I want to do today, I guess, is just narrow that context down a little bit more. And then maybe next week, hopefully, we can sort of wrap it up and uh, move on to to what is Jesus actually talking about when when he drills down and goes, therefore, now, because of everything else I've told you, because of what I've told you before, because of the platform I've laid, because of the understanding I've given you, now I want to coach you in why it's possible to live a life with, by diminishing worry and trusting me. It's possible to do. It sounds like a pipe dream for many. Uh, some people are probably sitting there thinking, but if I didn't have something to worry about, I'd be worried about that. What would I do if I had nothing to worry about? I worry about having nothing to worry about. And uh, some people live that way as if worry is normal. But Jesus, I think, wants to encourage his people that, that if we can understand what he's trying to say, he's trying to get us to a place where we acknowledge and understand it is possible, it actually is possible, to live a life where we're not consumed with worry and anxiety. Wouldn't that be great life to live? Wouldn't that be great? I'm the only one here that thinks that would be great. That's awesome. That's okay. I'm the only one here today that thinks a lot of the things... Uh, it's all right. It's okay. Matthew chapter 6. If you remember the very first week that we started talking about worry and anxiety, I made this statement two or three weeks ago that, that worry is not a sin, but worry was a symptom. Anyone remember that? Worry is not a sin, it's a symptom. And you know, when people say to you that, that worry is a sin, I don't believe that's what Jesus was getting at here. Jesus was not saying, if you worry about something, then you're guilty of sin. He wasn't saying that. What he was saying is that worry is is not a sin. It's a symptom of something. And a few weeks ago, we looked at what is it? It's a symptom of something, and it points us to something. So if you've got a a runny nose, it's a symptom of something, and what you do is you reach for a tissue, don't you, and blow your nose. If you've got a scratchy throat, it's a symptom of something. You reach for the solution, which might be Benadryl or cough medicine. If you've got a headache, it's a symptom of something not right, something going on, and so you reach for what you think is the answer, the antidote to that, and you reach for a Panadol or you reach for a Nurofen. 
And Jesus is kind of following the same logic here. He's saying that worry is a symptom. It's a symptom of something. And we, we looked at uh, Philippians. And in Philippians, it tells us that, that we shouldn't, don't worry or be anxious for anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, let your request be made known to God. So Philippians shows us that while anxiety and worry are a symptom, what they're pointing us to, just as a runny nose points you to a tissue, a headache points you to pen. Panadol, um, worry and anxiety should point us to prayer as Christians. He's writing to believers. So if you're a believer in Jesus here, he's speaking to you. If you're not, then, then you may not understand this or you may not agree or take it on board for your world. That's okay. But I want to say to you, there's a lot of wisdom in what Jesus taught. Um, I heard a guy say once, uh, anyone who can predict his own death, uh, burial, uh, uh, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection and actually pull it off. Anyone that can do that, it's worth listening to absolutely everything else that that guy had to say. Who would agree with that? Well, Jesus did that, and because he did that, I think it's worth taking note of everything else that he had to talk about when it comes to life and, 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 and human existence, relationships, money, whatever the topic might be. And so as Christians, that's why we take seriously what we read in this collection of ancient documents, because God, if God can pull that off for the sake of humanity, then what God has to say is true, and we need to trust and believe and act on what he has to say. And so just as prayer, as a runny nose is a symptom that points you to something, anxiety and worry points us to the place of prayer. So that's what we go to. That's the solution. But even though worry and anxiety are a symptom and we know what the solution is, prayer, but what are worry and anxiety an actual symptom of? What are they actually a symptom of? We know where they lead us to. We know the solution. We know where they're pointing us to. Uh, but what are they actually a, a uh, symptom of? And I want to just put it this way. I believe that worry and anxiety can be, and I'm not talking about medically diagnosed, and I don't want to go over that again, go back on our YouTube channel, we've covered that. But I believe that worry is a symptom of an area of my life where I'm not able to fully trust God just right now. It's not that you don't necessarily have some form of trust, but it's not developed enough to allow the peace of God to replace that anxiety and worry. So what's it a symptom of? Worry, I believe, is a symptom of uh, an area of my world where I just don't quite have faith yet to trust God with that particular part of my life. If God is everything that these ancient documents say he is, and who believes he is? If God one day looked into the void and said, let there be, and there was, and who believes that, that he did? If God said, let us make man in our own image, and he made us and fashioned us in his own image, if you believe that. If everything written in here is true, if, if God was able to lead two million Egyptians to the edge of the Red Sea and have a man lift uh, 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 his arms and have the sea part, if that's true, if God was able to make the sun stand still in the sky for a day, if God was able to, through uh, Elijah, as we talked about the other week, to call uh, millions of Jewish people and all the prophets of Baal together and to, uh, in one moment, ignite the sacrifice of God and, and make absolute a mockery of all these demon prophets and so on and turn an entire nation's heart back to him. If God is able to send his son come down to mankind in human form, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is God in human form, that's what we as Christians believe. If Jesus, God was able to come down in the form of Jesus and carry upon himself the punishment for the world. In other words, every sin that you or I have ever committed, will ever commit, maybe are committing. If 2,000 years ago, God was able to, in the form of Jesus, carry upon himself the punishment for that so that everybody that puts their faith in him can know that my future doesn't entail punishment from God now for my sin because Jesus took care of that 2,000 years ago. If God can do all of that, if God can do all of that, then is there any area of my world that I legitimately can't eventually come to a place of trusting him for? Is there any area of my world that is too big that the God of the universe cannot get involved in that area of my world? Well, I believe that worry and anxiety breathe in those areas of our life where we haven't come to a place of fully being able to trust God 
yet. Now, there might be some people sitting there going, oh, you're picking on... I'm not picking on anybody. You see, I think, I think, I think part of the problem, part of, part of the problem perhaps for some believers... Now, I'm going to go a little bit heavy here today. Is that okay? Normally, it's a little bit more light and fluffy, like the, the soft dough on the top of the pie. Today, it's just hard dough. Um, but I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us a little bit to have a good look in our world and a good look in our life and be honest with ourselves and honest with God. Where is our faith really at? Where's it really at? Where's my faith in God really at? See, I can, I can trust God for an eternity that I haven't yet seen. I can trust God that when I die and fall off the perch, that I'm going to step across the threshold into something I haven't yet seen. I can, I, can, I can stand here and say, I trust God for that. You don't know whether I really do or not, do you? You don't really know. I can tell you I do because it's something way down the track that we're not confronted with right now. So I can say, no, it's, I, I trust God. But it's another kettle of fish to say, I trust God for today. I can trust God for, for then, for eternity, but can I trust God for the things that I legitimately need in my world right now? Can I and do I trust God? And if I'm brutally honest with you, here's how it works for me. There are areas of my life where I really, really have great faith and trust in God, mainly because of I've made the decision in certain areas to go, this is what I believe God says. And so based on that, I'm going to step into that and begin to live it. See, some of us, want to, some of us are waiting for faith to drop. We want that feeling, that emotion, something mystical is going to happen to me and faith will drop. Anyone relate to that? And when faith drops, then I go, oh, I'm going to step into it now because the faith dropped. My experience is very different to that. My experience has always been I, I get into the Word of God and I pray and I begin to discover things about who God is. And I begin to see why God says this is the best way to live. And then I begin to go, you know what, God? I'm starting to think you have a little more knowledge about this kind of stuff than I do. And I know that sounds arrogant, but everybody sitting here, we're all exactly the same. We, we can talk a big game, but how many areas of your life do you still do what you think's right and you don't fully trust God enough to step into it? We're all there, people. We all suffer from this incredible thing called being human. And guess what? God made us that way. So are we going to blame God for that? No, we don't blame God for that. We're on a journey and we're all having our faith kind of develop and, and, and shift and change and grow. But if we're honest, there are areas where we, 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 we can trust God so much more now than other areas. And maybe it's because we're waiting for that faith to drop first, then we step into it. I find the areas of my life where I have the greatest faith in God, where I know God meets my needs and takes care of me, are those areas where, based on his word, I made the decision to step into it by faith. And then as I stepped into God by faith then I have those faith drop moments because all of a sudden God comes through and proves that he's right. Many years ago, I, I joined an organisation called Youth with a Mission. This is going back to uh, 1990, early 90s. I, was, I, I, got, I came to faith in Jesus as a 19-year-old uh, kid with no church background, no God background, never had a Bible in my house, didn't hear nothing about Jesus, had no, uh, uh, nothing to do with Jesus, church, Bibles, religion, anything. We're far removed from that. But through a series of events, I came to faith in Jesus at 19 years of age. I gave my life to him. And then I hear about this organisation called Youth with a Mission. Long story short, it's a youth training organisation. Probably, in my opinion, one of the best in the world. Just my opinion. And so, all of a sudden, I felt like the Holy Spirit impressed upon me, you should go to this organisation do a six-month training school. The downside was it cost money. And if there was something I didn't have back in those days, it was money. We, I wasn't brought up in an affluent uh, place. I didn't know how to handle the money, didn't know how to do uh, it. Was just, money was just that thing that if you were lucky enough to get it, you hung on to it as long as you possibly could because you never knew when the next one was going to drop, the next penny was going to come. And so I remember um, uh, getting these papers and then uh, going to sign my sort of life away to YWAM for six months and then realising that it was going to cost me, uh, I think it was uh, back in those days, $1,995 or something. It's about a lot more than that now, but back then it was about $2,000. I did not have a single dollar. And so I'm sitting there going, there's no way I have that money, and I've only just picked up a job at a chicken farm boning chickens and up cutting bones out of dead chooks. So I've done the math, I've got to pay rent and all this, I'm not going to make it. So at that point, what do I do? Do I just go, no, I can't, 
Or do I step out in faith? I believe God's spoken to me. I think he's shown me something. He's told me what he wants me to do for this period of my life anyway. And so what I decided to do was I filled out the forms and I sent them off in faith. I took a step in faith towards a direction that at that point I didn't have faith. I didn't have a faith drop. I didn't have any feeling. I just felt like it was the right thing to do. I was convinced and so I stepped out into that. Well, long story short, Six months before that, I meet this guy from Redcliffe in Brisbane. Our connection is because we both loved rugby league and rugby union. We met for about a day. I cannot even remember where, how, or why. We just connected somewhere for a day, disappeared out of my life. About a week before I'm going to get in my car and drive up to Brisbane, and I'm contemplating, I don't have the money, I don't know how to do this. They weren't a registered training organisation back then like they are now, so there's no off study, none of that stuff. What am I going to do? I get a letter in the mail, I open it up, and it's a letter from this guy that I met six months earlier, one day chance encounter, and he writes this letter, and he says, hey, I don't know how he even found out, somewhere along the grapevine, someone told me you've come to faith in Jesus, and they told me that you're looking at doing a training school. Well, here's your money to pay for your training school, and I got a check. Anyone remember what checks looked like? You used to have paper, and you used to write things on them, non-negotiable, so no one could change the numbers. Um, well, anyway, I get a check. So at that moment, I've stepped down in faith. I didn't have the faith, but I just did what I felt was right. And then all of a sudden, this money comes through. And what do you think happens in that moment? All of a sudden, this little bit of faith begins to drop into my world. Hey, guess what? You can trust God with even money. You can trust God for that area of your world. Similar thing happened three months later. We were about to go on an outreach and we were flying overseas and I felt like God had spoken to me. I felt impressed of God that I was to go to Indonesia and uh, Malaysia for an outreach. I'd, 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 going up there was only the second time my entire life I'd been outside the state of New South Wales. That was just to go to Brisbane for the training school. So to get on a plane and fly somewhere was bizarre. But again, I felt like God said. So I went and got my vaccinations and did all the prep work that had to be done, got my visa, all that stuff. The morning came and we had to have our money that lunchtime in order to pay for the ticket to be able to go. And I didn't have the money. So I sat through lectures all that morning looking, pretending to be really spiritual, probably like many of us do on a Sunday. Oh, yes, I'm really listening to you, but I'm thinking about other things. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to miss out. What am I going to do? What does that mean, God? Anyway, lunchtime comes, everybody goes, right, get ready, go and grab a sandwich, jump in the bus, we're going to pay the travel agent, and uh, I'm going, right out, well, I'm just going to pick up a seat and sit at the table and have my cheese sandwich because I obviously don't have the money. And I walk into the room and I look up at the little letterbox there that each student got. It was like a shrine. They used to go there and worship this thing, hoping something would pop out at them. And I walked up to my little letterbox and there's a letter in there, I pull it out. And I rip it open. And here's a letter from a lady. When I became a believer, I started going to a little church in Ballina, Ballina Uniting Church. This is 30 years ago. I started going to Ballina Uniting Church, and there was a lady there. And I met this lady, and she uh, had just had a, a, a terrible situation in her life. She, she'd gone through a divorce, and she was heading off to South Australia, I believe it was, to go to Bible college. And anyway, she's going off to Bible college, and, and I go off to, to, to YWAM, and I had no contact with her at all. And then what ends up happening is I get this letter in the mail, I open up, and here's this letter. She says, hey, Alan, I just want to let you know a bizarre thing happened. I, I finalised the sale of my home after the, the divorce, and I got this certain amount of money, and I, I gave a certain amount to each of my children, and as I did, the Lord spoke to me and said, hey, Alan's my child, would you give him some money too? And so she said, so I'm writing out this cheque to give you, because God spoke to me. The cheque was the exact to the cents. I'm talking to the cents, the exact amount of money I needed to go and hand to the travel agent to get on that plane and go. Now, do you think that faith dropped into me in that moment? You better believe it. And I've had a whole series of events happen in my world where if there's one area where I really have faith for, it's faith when it comes to God financially looking after me. I have no doubt, but it's only come from stepping into that place. But you know what? There are other areas of my life where I don't have that same amount of faith. There are other areas in my world where I still wrestle with faith. When I'm sick, sometimes I wrestle with the thought that God would want to heal me. I could pray for you, and I believe that God could, but, but I wrestle with the fact that God might take care of my physical life. It's, sometimes it's a battle. It's a struggle. The point I'm making is that we all have faith in different areas and to different degrees. And Jesus is talking. Let, let, let's look at Matthew 6 in its full context. Jesus is talking about faith. That's exactly what the entirety of Matthew chapter 6 is. It's a discussion about where's your faith at? Where's your faith really at? 
He starts off by going, uh, talking about, about these guys that um, do their charitable gifts in front of everybody. He says, if you do your charitable gifts in front of everybody, for everybody to see. Then he talks about people that pray for everybody to see. And then he goes on, he talks about fasting to be done so that everybody can see it. And he contrasts the fact that if you do that stuff for everyone to see, you're going to get a reward, but it comes from them, but you'll forfeit a reward that comes from God. In other words, you're going to get your needs met somehow. Who do you really believe is going to meet those needs? Because whoever you believe is going to meet those needs, they're the ones you're going to perform for the most, aren't they? They're the ones you're going to put yourself out there for the most. They're the ones that you really want to see you. They're the ones that you really want to notice you. And so this whole discourse in Matthew chapter 6 is really at its very core. It's a discussion about faith and it's Jesus getting them to reflect as they're sitting there on the Sermon of the Mount and look at themselves and go, where's my faith? Where's it really at? Is, is, is my faith in you that you'll be able to meet all my needs and I do all my performances in front of you? And he goes on, he talks about hoarding up riches. Is my faith in myself, my own ability to just collect enough into my world that I can take care of myself? And then he goes on, he goes, I'm going to show you another way. I'm going to show you a better way. But he's talking about faith. And in, in that context, I want to give you these three types of faith that I think that we can ask ourselves the honest, humble question. Where am I at right now in my world in terms of my trust in God? Three areas, three different types of faith. Because worry and anxiety are attracted to those spaces in your world where trust in God is absent or underdeveloped. You don't worry about those areas of your world when you know somebody else has got control. We worry when we feel like it's out of control, don't we? When the outcome is out of control. When we don't know who's... My wife used to often make this statement. She would, she would, uh, when I would travel, I used to travel a fair bit. And she would always say when I would come home that she felt a lot more safe and peaceful when I was in the house. She just, when I was in the home, she would just feel a lot more relaxed and peaceful because she knew that I was there. Well, I, I guess Jesus is kind of painting that picture and, and saying that, you know, if you want peace in your world, to the degree that you believe Jesus is in your house, that Jesus is over those areas, that God cares for those areas of your world, that he's got an eye on them, that he's looking out for them, to the degree that you actually trust God in that area is the degree to which you set yourself up to actually have peace in that area. To the degree that you do not trust God is the degree to which you can allow anxiety and worry to come and fill that space. Who wants to live with anxiety and worry and who wants to live with peace? I believe it's the will of God that we live with peace. Jesus actually said that. He said, he said I, I, I want to give you a peace, but he said, I want to give you a peace not like the world gives you. You know, the peace the world gives you, he said, it comes and goes. It comes and goes depending on your situation, your circumstance. If you think you're going to find peace when you find that pretty boy or that, uh, that pretty boy. Pretty boy, who's a pretty boy? If you think, I'm stumbling on my words here today. If you, think, if you think that that handsome hunk of a man is going to bring peace into your world or that beautiful, attractive female is going to bring peace into your world, guess what? It's such a temporary peace. That hunk of a man, even if you stick it out with him, one day he won't be a hunk of a man. <laughs> One day he's going to look like me. <laughs> Women seem to last way a lot longer than us men do, I reckon. Um, but us men, we, we, we disappear pretty quick. Uh, maybe it's because we don't do enough patchwork during the week, I don't know. Um, anyway, what was I saying? <laughs> now I'm sweating because I've got to go home after this. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm, I'm giving you a piece that the world can't compete with. You can't compete with it. If you think that, that, that reaching the million dollar mark in your bank account is going to give you peace, then you know what happens? You reach the million dollar mark and you have a false peace because when the account drops down to $999,999, guess what? Your peace starts to get a bit... Oh, 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 what's happening? Jesus said, I want to bring a peace into your world, a peace that the world can't shake, a peace that the world can't compete with. They can't match it. Because this is a peace that comes into your world that's not shaken or changed by any external set of circumstances that happen. You can live through a coronavirus pandemic and not lose the peace that God wants to give you. But if you don't think he's in control, then of course you, you might be all over the shop. But if you understand that God is in control of the world, no matter what information you're hearing, no matter what information's come, God, God is either in control or he's not. Isn't it interesting? The, the, I, I talk to a lot of people through this season of life we're in. It's amazing how many people's faith and it's the, 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 the very thing that sustained them when there was no big turmoil, now all of a sudden they're wondering, ooh, I don't know whether I should this, I should that, I should this. You know what? Whatever you do, do in faith. Trust God. 
Commit it to God. Let the peace of God come upon you and do what you feel to do. Okay? Do what you feel to do at the end of the day. But here's the thing. If, if God is truly in control of this whole thing, then I know that he's got my best interests at heart. I know that if the, even if the world was to collapse, it's not going to collapse because God blinked and dropped it and forgot. If it collapses, it collapses because it's God's time for it to collapse. That's what I believe. That's what my faith in God tells me. And faith in God is what breeds peace. Faith in an area of our world breeds peace. And those areas, I'm just throwing it at you, that area today where maybe you, don't, you can't find peace, you're worrying. I want you to ask yourself the honest question. Do you trust God with that area of your world? It's not a condemning question. It's an honest question. And until we're honest and real with ourselves about where we're really at in life and where we're really at with faith, then we never really progress and grow, do we? They talk about people with addiction problems. The first thing they have to do is admit they've got a problem. <laughs> if you never admit you've got a problem and you go through life with that problem, then you'll never change. You'll never come out of it. The first point uh, for, for people with, with, with addictions and stuff is to at least admit they've got a problem. You know, I believe a good place for many in the church to start is to admit too. Maybe our faith is not as gung-ho as what we think it is. Maybe we still have areas of inadequacy. Maybe we're still, we're still works in progress. Who's, who's, who's not a work in progress in this room? I'm a work in progress. I, I, I'm, I'm still growing. I'm still learning to trust. I've still got to get into this. You know, you want, it's, it's, this is not like a novel. You don't read it once and go, I'll finish that one. What's the next book? <laughs> Mate, I live in this thing. I have to. Because it, it's, it's the only place where I find answers that are unshakable. It's the only place where I find a God who doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the only place where I find a picture of a God who cares for me, whether I'm doing really, really well or whether I'm stuffing up completely. It's the only place I find someone that is so committed to me that he would die for me. Is in the pages of this book. Running out of time. Real quick, I want to just throw three types of faith at you this morning. And I just want you to have a think about maybe where your faith is at. And again, this is leading into Matthew chapter 6. I keep saying we're going to get there, and we are going to get there. But when we land there, I want you to completely understand everything Jesus is trying to get the crowd to understand. Because he starts by saying, therefore, do not worry about your life. And we're looking at what the therefore is therefore by looking backwards at everything previously that he had to say. Three different types of faith. The first one is no faith. Some people have no faith. Ramsey McMullen, he's a... a, a, um, a, a um, a history professor at Yale University, I think it is. His name's Ramsey McMullen. He wrote a book many years ago called Christianizing the Roman Empire. At one point, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, now Rome was anti-Christian. Um, Rome had, they worshipped their own emperors. How did they go from being so anti-Christian to becoming a, a nation, the, the power brokers of the world, where Christianity became the number one religion? And in this book, he looks at all different angles of that. And he comes to the conclusion, I think it's a fair conclusion to say, that um, part of it was genuine conversions from people who genuinely found faith in Jesus Christ and came to understand him as the, the creator of the universe and the one that died for their individual, their personal sins, and was the only means by which they could find peace with God was through his death. There were those. But he also makes this, 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 this uh, point that as it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the church were given certain quirks. And if you belonged to the church, you got, there were certain societal benefits that came your way. There were certain personal benefits that came your way. So once upon a time, it just wasn't sexy to be a Christian and relate to the church because these guys are getting persecuted and killed and beaten and fed to lions. All of a sudden, they get in the positions of power and prestige and they've got a big say in the vote. And they, all of a sudden, they got all these things opened up to them. And so people who wanted to improve and better their world, they said, well, I'll become one of those because that's going to give me a better standing in life than that did. Were they really saved? No, they weren't. Because the faith that Jesus talks about is, is faith in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. What brings you into the true church is when we put our faith in Jesus, what he did, and then by his spirit, we're placed into this body called the church. And you know what? I don't think it's any different today, too. The church is a wonderful place, isn't it? It's a fantastic place. I mean, if you, if you don't think the church is a great place, you're probably hanging out with the wrong group. When I say church, I mean the body of Christ, the, the belief. I, 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 there's nowhere else I go in my week where I surround myself with people who are so nice to me. You're so nice to me. It's unbelievable. I go down to Ballin a Touch where I've been president there for 11 years. I've just handed that over, but I'm vice president. I go down there and guess what? Not everybody's really nice to me. But I come to church. Everyone is so nice to me. I used to coach rugby league and I'd go down there and guess what? Not everybody was nice to me. 
I come back to church, everybody is so nice to me. I just love it so nice. It's a place of belonging. If, if you want to find a place to belong, come along to a gathering of God's people because you know what? Part of our DNA is we love everybody. We'll accept everybody. And so there are a lot of benefits and a lot of good things about coming along to church and sometimes people can come along to church and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have faith. Is that right? I'm saying come along, it's a great thing. What I'm saying is don't kid ourselves and think just because I come along to a religious meeting once a week, I've got faith. Do you have faith? Do you trust? Do you believe in the death, burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a moment in history 2,000 years ago that took place? Do you believe that he died not for anything he did but because of the stuff that you've done and I've done? And then you've got to make a choice. Are you going to stand in front of God, a holy, perfect God, on your own merits and hope you're good enough to make it? Here's a hint, you're not. Or are you going to put your faith in Jesus and trust that what he did was for you so that when you stand before God, God looks at you and he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus Christ and goes, come on in. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's a group of people that have no faith. There's a second group, and it's people with underdeveloped faith. Underdeveloped faith. So they believe God for salvation. We can believe God for the eternal thing, as we've spoken about, but believing God for the day-to-day cares of my own world. Can I trust him for that? Can I really submit to him and really trust, A, that he knows what I need, and B, that he will provide what I need? Now, don't lose the emphasis on that he knows what I need, because you live in a culture that's screaming at you every day telling you what you need. How many of you know that you need a bigger car? I mean, who knows that? You do. You just got to turn on the TV, they'll tell you. The prophets on TV will tell you, you need a better car. You need a bigger home. You need new clothing. You need this type of deodorant. It's the best. You need this kind of soap. You need this moisturizer. You need to buy these earrings. You need to shop at this place. You need, you need, you need. And the world just spits out at us, this is what it means to live, this is what it means to be human. And and yet, you know what? I reckon God is the one that I want to listen to the most when it comes to my own needs. Because trying to trying to fill my world with the needs the world tells me I need is going to send me broken, batty. Because the funny thing is, I've I've never ever seen a sales song where they said, Stop, you've got enough. We've got this great range of clothing, but hey, you've got enough clothing in your wardrobe, so don't come to us. No, no, no. That should last you another two years. No way. You're just walking out the door and they're already chasing you going, hey, we've got a new one, come and get the new one. That's old hat, you don't want to wear that one. It's still got the tags on it. Doesn't matter, it's old. Come and get a new one. There are people who still have underdeveloped faith. Matthew 6 and verse 30, Jesus says this. He asks this question. He says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? I love this, oh, you of little faith. Underdeveloped faith. Even if you've got underdeveloped faith, God still cares for you and God can still meet your needs. Okay? It's amazing when you read the Gospels how much Jesus did for people that had little faith, isn't it? I know that we should be standing here going, we've all got to be great kings of the faith, and you know, but the truth of the matter is I'm amazed at how much Jesus did for people and then said, you've got little faith. So I go, God, I wish I had that little faith. My faith must be so minuscule compared to that because I struggle with some of these simple things in my world. Faith is something that we grow in, something that gets developed in our world. It's not something that, oh, I gave my life to Jesus, that's it, I've made it. No, no, I'm constantly learning. It's like a relationship. When I married my wife, I didn't know absolutely everything about her. I didn't. And so we get married, we make that commitment, but then begins this journey of getting to know one another more deeper and more intimately. Now, I'm not going to go anywhere. Theo's laughing, thinking I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'm not. It's been an amazing journey. And everything I've learned has been excellent. excellent. Not a thing would I change. It's like that with God. We come to faith, but then the more we get to know God, the more we begin to trust him, the more we begin to step out, our faith begins to develop. It's not a problem where your faith is at now. The problem is if we don't know where it's at and if we don't care where it's at. Because otherwise, Matthew chapter 6 means nothing to you. You'll never trust God for the basic necessities of your world if you don't understand some of the things he's trying to say. There's no faith, then there's underdeveloped faith. And then the third one, and this is, I think, the big challenge for the church at the moment, is there's a hybrid faith. There's a hybrid faith. The definition of hybrid is this. It's a thing made by combining two different elements. In other words, 
I want the best of the church and the best of the world. I want the best the church has to offer, but I also want the world too. I want to come along and I want to uh, hear that my sins are forgiven and I want to uh, fellowship with you guys and sing songs and have that really great feeling yet when we gather together, but I also want to go out and do my own thing and bomb myself on this and sleep around and chase after. I, I want that too. And then I want to come to church and I want you to tell me it's all okay, I'm forgiven, but then I want to go back out and I still want to do that. It's a hybrid type faith. We're living in a day and age right now where the Christian worldview is very much tending towards a hybrid type of a faith. Let's reinterpret words in, in, in these ancient documents so that we can get away with more and more and more in society to the point where we don't know where Christianity ends and the world begins anymore. We'll reinterpret things that have stood for 2,000 years to mean this. We'll reinterpret it. Not because, not because we've changed what this... We, we, we've, we've come to a deeper understanding of the Greek language or Hebrew language or whatever. No, we're changing it because we're looking out the world going, we can't continue to have the best out there and the best here if we don't change a few things in here. And they're not going to change. The world isn't going to change. It's going to keep progressing down the path it wants to go down. So we better change some things in here so that we can come up with a kind of a hybrid faith so that we can still have the best of both worlds. And it's very, very prevalent in today's society, in today's church. It's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. A hybrid version of faith. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Here's what Jesus says. This is the very beginning of this whole thing. He says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Watch this. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. It, it, it's, it's, it's almost like Jesus is saying... You just can't have both rewards. Which one do you want? And if you want that one, that's fine. That's okay. Go for it. But if you want the reward that the world gives you, just, just understand, you forfeit the reward I have for you. I have a reward for you. I really do. I've got things I want to bring into your world and things I want to do. But if you really want that one, then go after it. But just understand, you miss out on this one because you can't have both. There's no such thing as a hybrid faith. Jesus' followers knew what they were getting into when they began to follow him. They knew what their, their, their life was committing to when they committed their lives to Jesus. And I guess that's the thing. They committed their lives to Jesus, not just little bits and pieces that weren't going so well at the time. So I'll give you this little bit here because it's not going so well. But I want to keep all this over here because I'm really popular in this area or it's really working for me or I'm making lots of money over here or I'm, you know, and we separate. We come up with this hybrid version of faith and Jesus is just making it very clear. No such thing as a hybrid version of faith. Now here's the truth. If you don't have any faith in Jesus, then you've actually got an extremely legitimate reason to be worried today. If you have no faith at all in God, if you have no faith in there being an eternal creator, then you have great reason to be concerned and worried when you look at the world today. Because it really is, apart from God, out of control. So my encouragement to each of us here this morning is I just want to leave you with this thought and this question. Where is your faith at? Would you say that you have no faith? That's okay. Just own it and progress towards faith. Get into these ancient documents. Find out who Jesus is. Maybe you have uh, uh, little faith or underdeveloped faith. But if you've got underdeveloped faith, again, why don't you get into the Word of God? Why don't you ask some questions? Why don't you begin to develop faith in those areas? Start by asking yourself this question. What am I most worried about right now? What am I most worried about right now, at this moment, today? What's my biggest worry? And get into the, the, these ancient documents and find out what does God say about that area of life? What does God say? You know what the world says? You know what you think? What does God say about that particular area of your life? Or maybe you've got a hybrid faith. In which case, why don't you be honest and go, you know what, I really do want to live in both camps. But just understand this. The choice is ultimately yours. And this is the beauty of God. God says you have the choice to get rewarded wherever you want the reward to come from. You have the choice. But know this, if you choose the world, then you can't have it both ways. Take a pick. I love you that much that I'm going to give you the choice. I love you that much that I'm going to give you the, 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 the final say, I guess the casting vote on where that reward comes from. But I'm encouraging you, look to God. Look to God. Corey Ten Boom said this once. She said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. The future might be unknown, but God is not. The future might, to some degree, be unknowable, but God is not. 
And to the degree that we know God in that area where we worry is the degree to which we allow ourselves to begin to have peace in that part of our world. And I believe Jesus wants you to have peace. Amen. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you for the peace of God. Father, that surpasses all human understanding. God, a peace that circumstances can't change, a peace that the world can't take away. God, it's a peace that the world can't even compete with. But because it surpasses understanding, Father, it's so hard for many of us to actually think it's real. But it is, God. And and so, Father, I pray for each person here this morning. Lord, I pray that we would have a, a bit of a think about our faith. But we'd have a bit of a think about our relationship with you. That, God, we'd just be humble and honest enough to go, this is where I am right now. Father, you already see it. You already know it. It's not going to surprise you. But, God, at least it gives us a point from which to move forward, a point of reality. So, God, we just, I just pray for each of us in this room. Continue to take us on this journey of faith. Continue to reveal yourself to us, Lord. And, God, I do pray for those people right now that have that area of worry in their life. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, God, as I open up the Bible... I pray that you would take them to those places where they can understand your character and your nature and how you see that. And most of all, God, how you see them in the midst of that worry. That, Father, it's not your will that we worry and stress. It's your will that we bring these things to you and that we allow the peace of God to fill that space. Worry and anxiety want to destroy us. God, your peace brings life to us. And so, Father, I just pray for those people as well this morning, Father. In Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Amen. We've got some visitors here. Very sorry today. Some days, you know, like chucking out, you know, Smarties and stuff. Some days you're chucking broccoli at people. Uh, and today was a broccoli day. I acknowledge that it was a broccoli day. But, uh, you know, it just had to be. I feel like with the journey we're going on, I had to throw a broccoli at you today. Uh, maybe next week we'll chuck a few Smarties in with the broccoli. We'll see how we go. Uh, anyway, uh, bless you guys. We've got team coffee next door. Um, anyone wants to know anything about the four, two for six, eight dinners as well? Um, come and see Pete, because a lot of people sitting here are probably going, I don't really understand what that's about. Come and see Pete, and Pete can fill you in about those dinners. They're a great idea. Bless you guys.